Hello and welcome to oh. Goat. Here we go. <laughs> Hello, good evening, and welcome to Goat and Last Words, a podcast for air cadets. I'm CI Me. And I'm Sergeant White. And we are from 361 Squadron. And what are we learning about this week? So this week, instead of learning how planes fly, we're learning how planes crash. Oh, well. Specifically talking about different plane crashes over the next coming weeks. So this week, we will be talking about Indonesia Air Asia Flight 8501. You ever mm. heard of it before? I actually haven't. So I'm going to learn something I'm new. get ready. Right. Today's session. So... Indonesia Air Asia Flight 8501 was a scheduled international passenger flight operated by Indonesia Air Asia. And it left from a place called Surabaya, Indonesia, and it was heading off to Singapore. On the 28th of December 2014, the Airbus A320 flew away and crashed into the Java Sea, killing all 162 people on board. When the search operations ended in March of 2015, only 116 bodies had been recovered. Where's the uh, Java Sea? Between Singapore and Surabaya. Whereabouts is that? What's like, is there like a big ocean that it's near? I'm just trying to get, because I've never heard of that uh, sea before. Do you know where Singapore is? Ish. So it's just the sea around that. Right, okay. So not all of the bodies were actually discovered then? No. No, so we're still so missing. Sad. Yeah, we're still missing about fifty ish ish bodies. So we'll go to the day of the crash and we'll kind of work through it in a timeline. Mm. So five fifteen AM, December twenty eighth, two thousand and fourteen, and we're at the Jorwand Airport in Surabaya, Indonesia. One hundred and fifty five passengers and seven crew members are boarding the Air Asia flight on a routine flight to Singapore. Singapore, one of the world's busiest airports, mm. very common route. Nothing out of the ordinary should have happened on this flight. Yeah. So air traffic controllers assign the flight the call sign 8501. Okay. So it's known a lot in the media as 8501 crash or the Air Asia 8501 crash. Because that code crash. is only that, associated with that flight. So it will be associated with different flights again. Yeah. But that, so that, that flight path. Will, in that airspace at that time. At that time, that was that specific one. So, we'll tell you a little bit about the captain and the co-pilot and things mm-hmm. like that. So, our captain was Captain Irananto. He was aged 53 and he was an Indonesian national. He had a total of 20,500 flying hours. Whoa. Yeah. Four and a half, like 4,500 hours of which were in this specific aircraft. So, a seasoned pilot and specifically at this pilot. particular aircraft. Yeah. yeah. So, 4,500 hours were in the Airbus A320 so that's probably longer than most people will spend in their s- school building, probably, yeah, for no, their yeah. whole... So he's accustomed to the plane he's flying in. Yeah. So he began his career with the Indonesian Air Force. He graduated as a pilot in 1983, and he was a fighter jet pilot. Right, okay. So he's flown, you know, some of the most difficult planes there are. He then took early retirement from the Air Force in the mid-2000. He joined Adam Air. And then he worked for two other airliners before he joined Indonesia Asian Air. And he'd been flying with Indonesian Asian Air for over 6,100 hours. God, wow. Yeah. So a lot of a pilot's career is measured in hours rather than years. Right, okay. Because, you know, if you're doing a short-haul flight and it's only three hours, and compared to doing a, I don't know, 20-hour flight somewhere yeah. else, the skills of a pilot is just easier measured by hours than days worked or whatever i think so. a longer flight it requires a lot more sort of i would say endurance yeah it requires different skills yeah exactly yeah so his first officer so his co-pilot was named remy am am, am? <laughs> remy emmanuel palese and he was 46 years old so they were they were an older they were older on the yeah. older scale of things and he was a french national Okay. Uh, he was less qualified, well, he was less experienced, is a better way to put it, than his pilot. Mm-hmm. And he only had 2,200 flying hours. But over half of that was on the Airbus A320. So about 1,300 hours. Still fairly seasoned. Yeah, now, we're on so, the yeah. Airbus A320. He was originally from France. He studied in Paris, but he was living in Indonesia at the time, and that's why he worked for this specific airline. Mm hmm. 
So the planned route from Surabaya crosses over the equator and these are home to some of the most destructive weather conditions known on the planet um, due to the intertropical convergence zone. Right, okay, tell us more about that. If you... So the intertropical convergence zone, hottest place on the planet. So the sea surface temperature within this convergence zone are quite hot. Right. So moisture starts to release itself from the sea the ocean water turns to vapor and this just becomes a fuel for a tropical storm so you think you've got all this moist hot water that's perfect for like thunderstorms lightning heavy rain big clouds turbulence basically everything you don't want to fly in is what this creates Mm. so not the best for flying but the pilots that work here it's their bread and butter they are used to flying in the tropics their job to know how to deal with those conditions yeah and on virtually every flight they'll be flying through there they will encounter some type of adverse weather conditions so whether that's high winds thunderstorms they're used to it it's a day-to-day occurrence for them it's Mm. nothing out of the ordinary for them whereas pilots in the uk might struggle with it it's their you know they know exactly what they're doing in situations like this so the aircraft, like we've already said, was an Airbus A320. Um, and it first flew on September 25th, 2008. So it was about six years old right, at this okay. point. Um, it had accumulated approximately th- 23,000 flight hours. Yeah. And it had about 13,000 flights okay. so the flights were it was that doing particular quite, plane that particular plane okay yeah. yeah so it was doing quite short haul flights hour two hour this journey in particular was only a short haul flight you know uh, it had undergone its most recent scheduled maintenance on the 16th of november so it was just a, a little bit over a month since its last fully right, scheduled it was december 28th yeah yeah so we we know the plane it's been serviced mm. the pilot's are used to it we've got one extremely seasoned pilot we've got one more junior pilot but they're both both used to flying in these conditions yeah yeah exactly. so we shouldn't have a problem so the crew settle in after 25 minutes they put on the autopilot and the autopilot consists of about seven different computers right okay so the plane's being flown by autopilot by the point we get to like a cruising stage so we've we've taken off we've climbed 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 25 minutes later autopilot's on everyone's happy right yeah so everything's absolutely normal here as well at this point yeah Yeah. so air traffic controllers receive 8501's final radio transmission later through this so, so the final one ever known to be ever made. ever known yeah that's so there's a website isn't there where you can hear black box recordings yeah there's a lot on youtube as well yeah So the plane requested permission to take a left turn and climb. So the air traffic controllers know where all the aircraft are, so not just this specific aircraft, and they'll only let a plane do a manoeuvre providing that it's safe. Yeah. And a lot of the times um, they might delay you being able to do that manoeuvre or they might just stop it completely until another aircraft has basically passed out of the way. So several nearby aircraft had already changed course in order to avoid flying into the heart of a storm so controllers deny 8501's request to climb above the storm Mm. Um, but this is very common being denied to move happens virtually every flight because you'll be passing through another plane's airspace at the same time if they're flying in the same directions yeah so the crew face a decision do they stay on course or do they change direction so staying on course would mean that they would have to travel through, through the dangers the, of the storm. Yeah, through the okay. storm. Or they could change course. So this was the only aircraft at 32,000 feet. At the other points, like the other aircraft on the same route were either at 34,000 feet or 38,000 feet. So they were the lowest. Okay. So everyone else was flying over the storm and they were, they okay. were the lowest in time altitude. So at 6.16, so like an hour later from the start of this, the radar records show that we're cruising at about 32,000 feet. Mm-hmm. But then the plane deviates from its course and it turns left. So Against the... Is that against, against the, the rules? Against the flight path. It's not against... 
So they were denied it, but they did it anyway. Is that no? Correct? They didn't do it anyway. Right. Okay. No. So they they were they were going. They decided they couldn't go the way they wanted to go, so they had to deviate. So that was the course stay. they right. That okay. was the course they've been allowed to take. Okay. Yeah. So they would have been flying with autopilot. And so any input changes would have simply been done by turning a knob, like as mm-hmm. easily as turning up the radio, yeah, turning it from like 15, 16, 17. That's all they have to do. They just click up the okay. knob and that would have been it. Yeah. So in the past 50 years, bad weather has been a factor for over half of the fatal commercial air accidents. That's crazy. That's scary. That makes, I've only ever been on one plane in my life. And I luckily didn't experience turbulence. It was a very short flight just from um, Newcastle to Amsterdam. But that was my first flight ever. I had no preconception of what happens when you get on a flight. Yeah. So for me, that was terrifying. Like, you know, the part where you sort of go back in your seat because it goes really, really fast on takeoff. Yeah, it's the G-Force. I didn't know that happened. <laughs> so I was just like... <laughs> <laughs> um. So, and obviously, like, you hear about turbulence and you see people like in planes when there's turbulence on films but it's always fine and they always say oh it's normal but if that's I mean the, it is normal it's just scary to know that the majority of crashes happen because of it so yeah if i'm ever on a plane not, in the future and there's turbulence i'm yeah. going to think this is the day well nec- it's not necessarily from the turbulence it's from the lack of the recovery from it okay yeah, yeah. so there's so much energy in storms and it just creates an incredibly chaotic dangerous turbulent but that's just something you have to deal with when you're flying those paths yeah. through that area. Mm-hmm. So it would be dark. There'll be lightning. The rain would be very, very heavy. Mm. The noise, if you imagine like the rain in a tent yeah. or the rain on like a conservatory, really, really loud. Rain on a car. Imagine that, but you're flying through it. Yeah. So incredibly loud, incredibly dark. So you wouldn't be able to hear as well. Yeah. And the turbulence can cause the instruments to shake as well. But, mm. but this is probably on older planes, the instruments would be shaking. A lot of them now are more, you know... Adapted to deal with that. A lot of them are digital. Mm-hmm. But the, you know, dials in older planes would be ricketing around. So the plane climbs through to 37,000 feet. And as it climbs, its speed slows to just over 400 miles an hour. And just 20 seconds later... The flight is around 38,000 feet and then it slows down even more. So it just, we what just going on then? shoot up over like a few seconds, really. That but is slowly. scary. Yeah. And then at 6.18 a.m., the plane goes missing from radar. Within an hour, air traffic controls, they, they have basically lost oh. track of the aircraft. Oh my goodness. Does that happen a lot? Planes don't go missing a lot, though. So it just... The dot on the radar just disappeared? Yeah. That is crazy. They just lost lost track of the air. Oh, that... Whoa. Yeah. I think I might have heard about this, actually, on a sort of conspiracy podcast. Oh, no, this isn't a conspiracy. Oh, right, okay. No. I think I've heard... I think they've linked this to... Because obviously you hear about stories of planes just disappearing. I mean, it doesn't disappear. We know where it is. Oh, okay. It disappeared oh. off the radar. Right, okay. We know where it is, though. So, the news is made public. 62 people are feared dead after Air Asia flight goes missing. Within three hours, a massive international search effort begins. Right, Right, okay. So, the Indonesian military are leading it. They're also supported by the countries surrounding them, really. So, Australia are helping them out. Um, Russia, Mm -hmm. America, I presume because they have bases down there as well. Uh, Singapore and chinese search teams so they have 30 ships Mm -hmm. three warships and 20 aircraft equipped with visual radar and sonar surveillance and they're covering an area of about sixty thousand square miles of the java sea so they're all they've all just rushed to it they've all pulled together yeah yeah to try and find this so this disappearance this probably is what you're talking about right brings back memories of the infamous unsolved mystery in the same region yeah. nine months earlier on the 7th of march 2014 so this is the malaysian yeah that's airline what i've i've read flight. i've listened to a podcast on that yeah. yeah so it was en route from kuala lumpur to beijing mm-hmm. with 239 people on board an hour into the scheduled flight disappears from radar screens and the search effort was the biggest ever launched but failed to find the missing plane 
Now that is eerie. Yeah. That's very eerie. So no one actually knows still still to this day. day. I think yeah. there's every now and again in the news you get a little like a resurgence of interest a little or tidbit. is there a new is there a new uh, development in this case? Yeah, and it'll no. be someone that's found a bit of debris in the sea and's been like is this from Malaysia? Like, it's terrifying. So for 3 days the world wondered if this would be another never-ending uh, mystery, but yeah. it was not. So people thought maybe it could be terrorism, could it be a rogue pilot, but then the wreckage is discovered. All of the evidence points to the plane having to have crashed in the sea and everyone on board is dead. Would they have, I know this is quite a dark question, but would would it have been a quick death, do you think? Because um, you kind of hope that it is. We can only hope. Yeah. So one of the first bodies to be recovered is that of a trainee flight attendant. So her funeral becomes the focus of national mourning. Unlike the Malaysian Airlines flight, there is no missing plane. So So they can't mourn as well. That's that's one of the worst things, you know? Yeah, in the Malaysian one. And that's the one we'll be talking about in the next. Uh, We'll also be talking about the Air France crash. All right, okay. So 10 days later, the first of the wreckage is located. There's a breakthrough when we find it. The black box. So what you talked about. We found the black box. Uh, So this is a data recorder, for those of you who don't know, from the Air Asia plane. It arrives back in Jakarta for examination. So it gets taken back so we can try and basically figure out what's happened. So is this built into every single... Every single Every single commercial or just every Every single single plane? plane. Every single plane. And that's like a foolproof way that you will know what happens before the crash. Is that why they're built in yeah so they're built in to be yeah they're basically built in to save data save recordings of you know telemetry re- like speech any comms any kind of yeah any kind of communication that can be and it's put into a black box so that it's basically survivable right yeah out of a crash yeah so as the recovery operation continues experts around the world begin to ask um, how one of the most sophisticated planes in the world at this point suddenly drops out of the sky. Yeah. Because it's not just Air Asia that have this aircraft. This aircraft would be on hundreds um, of... British? British, yeah. Like, you know, like things like Ryanair will probably have one of these aircraft. So any it? one of us, like me or We're you, probably, one of us listening has probably sat in one of probably these. probably flown in one. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So... Um, the researchers have the black box, but it's only going to tell part of the story. So they go into the data, they try and figure out the accident's origins. So there are three conditions that they think might have caused this crash. So can yeah. you think of three of the conditions? Um, they drove directly into the storm. So more just general. So yeah, so like weather. Loss of control of a, like recovering from the storm. Um, so if you were to categorize crashes into three different categories, so like what would they be so the first one could be weather conditions and then what would the other two be Mm, equipment malfunction yeah so instrument malfunction or human error yeah and then weather yeah yeah so it's either going to be something's broken in the plane something the pilot has done and it's just a human error that they've made the mistake or the weather has created one of those two things yeah so either the human error could be they didn't mean to do it or they did so that's probably where sort of terrorist attacks would happen like it would be under the yeah yeah so like it's yeah so like you know what i mean yeah Yeah. so like instrument human error or human involvement yes yeah and then weather Mm -hmm. yeah so in this one no one really knew Mm -hmm. so the first question was what caused the plane to climb so fast after just happily cruising at thirty two thousand feet went yeah. straight up yeah yeah so the plane turns left and climbs steeply just 40 seconds later the plane is over thirty-seven thousand feet um so that's and then the thirty-eight thousand feet so that's a climb of nearly six thousand feet than in less than a minute so it just shoots up and yeah. that's three times faster than normal and outside of the safety parameters set by the autopilot so this is now either as the autopilot messed up mm. or is this a pilot input kind of thing. So the plane, was it out of control or was it direct pilot action? Mm. So 6,000 feet a minute is a pretty hefty climb at altitude. I'm sure you know about like how like air gets thinner 
Yes. Uh, the yeah. further you get up, that's why you need oxygen when you climb Mount Everest and stuff like that. The atmosphere thins out. So climbing lower in the atmosphere is a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Climbing that quickly up there is very difficult to do because you just don't have the same atmospheric pressures up there. Yeah. So it's not only is it unexplained, but it's also confusing as to how they've managed to do this. So it's possible that they pulled the nose up and traded speed for altitude. So that's possibly what happened. The aircraft climbed too steeply, but there could be other reasons also as to why they ended up like that. Yes. So uh, that's the kind of human input. So the weather one is that they could have been on an updraft. Um, They were carried up by this big bubble of air. Out of their control, like it was too powerful. Kind yeah, or maybe they were trying to steer out of it and they yeah. accidentally just kept the you know the nose up whilst they were trying to get out of it. So a bubble of air is just a very turbulent, very chaotic kind of shift in yeah. pressure. Yeah. And as you know, what comes up must come down. So maybe after that massive updraft, you then got a massive downdraft and... Into the ocean. That would just be a terrible scenario for a pilot. Yeah. Like... That's really hard to recover you've from. You've just shot up into the air. Even a seasoned Yeah, you've just pilot, shot up into the air yeah. and suddenly you've been pointing up and now if that air pocket removes itself, you're suddenly falling down but your plane's facing the wrong direction. Yeah. Oh my goodness, yeah. I can't even imagine. So, mm-hmm. there's that. So experts have now, they think they have a good idea of what happened after the plane got above 38,000 feet. Mm-hmm. So they think that the Air Asia flight must have stalled. So do you know about... I did not know planes could stall. Yeah, so people normally, when they think about stalling, they think about stalling in a car. Yeah. So you know what happens with stalling in a car, don't you? Yeah. I've been in a car with you, Sergeant White. I know exactly what stalling is. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> <laughs> so what is stalling? So is it when... Um, I don't actually know what stalling is, but is it... Some- Just what happens. Uh, well, the engine stops. Yeah, so in a car... The engine stops, but that's not the case in aircraft. When we talk about aircraft stalling, it means the airflow is actually broken away from the wing and the aircraft no longer flies at this point. It's literally just falling out of the sky. Right, okay. So okay. you learn about this in principles of flight uh, in terms of like angles of attack and things like that. So basically the piece of air that's uh, running against the wing that's keeping the plane airborne breaks away completely. You just have this dead space between it. And you just, you're like a dead weight. So mm-hmm. the engine's still running, but the plane's falling. Yeah. So it's not like me where I just have to put the handbrake on, reset the engine, put it in first gear and drive away with shame. It's like the <laughs> engine's still going for them. They just... just emphasis on the shame part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the engine's still going. They just... Right, okay. Do. I guess that it's obviously they're, they're relying on a completely different arena of matter because we're on yeah. the ground, flat uh, on the ground, and yeah. they're, and they're focusing the on the floors of like air like the mm-hmm. i don't yeah. i'm someone who didn't well, do so, cadets i don't know anything about the principles of flight so i don't so know about if the you imagine if it. you just imagine a wing so if you hold your hand out imagine that's your, your wing yeah so if you imagine that you that's two wings just one wing please there you go so if you have <laughs> steady so if you imagine just some steady lines running across it so almost like yeah so just if you imagine air running across your hand mm-hmm. but then if you turn your hand uh, like kind of tilt it upwards as if you were trying to climb. Yeah. After a while, that air that was once running against your hand peels off. Yeah. So you reach the point where the flow starts to just separate completely, starting at the rear top and then it breaks away completely and this is known as a stall. So there are some really good videos on YouTube sh- using kind of um, like, I don't want to call it vape air, but like, clouded air so you can see it like like a slip like dry stream. ice kind of thing yeah yeah just like that and basically it shows the more the so you've got like all these nice lines just bumping over the wing and then the more and more that the wing pivots upwards it can't reach the bottom anymore and it basically just slowly peels up right. and then you have this whole section of wing where there's no air and the air on top of the wing like before they're nice quite straight lines you see it it all goes hazy it's very turbulent because it's going over a bump and instead of being able to follow the wing back down again and kind of suck it up, yeah. the wing's at too much of an angle for it to drop so it just shoots off and you get this turbulence above the wing. So that's why it's so hard to recover from a stall. Right, okay. Yeah. 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 So to regain control, you need to 
dip the nose. So we've already said if your yeah, so if your wing is up like that, and the bottom part of your wing is the thing that's not getting the the airflow. Air. Obviously, you need to tip it. When you lower the nose, nose then you're basic, rocks, yeah. yeah, you're moving it so that the air can touch the entire aerofoil and that should help you recover the stall. So it's a very dramatic thing. If you're not expecting it, it could be quite frightening. Yeah. It could be quite jarring. Like if out of nowhere, you're just falling. Yeah. So it takes quite a seasoned pilot or just someone who's well-trained to be able to get themselves out of that mm. so like if you're in a little plane you could even hit your head off the top of the ceiling of the cockpit because suddenly you're in the same place but your plane is going down <laughs> without you <laughs> can that just happen out of nowhere because because no. because how did it did it start in the first place because they took the wrong course directly no, so into it weather? started because we had that massive climb but w- what caused that massive climb we don't they, know. Well, they, right we okay don't know. so we don't know why they climbed that quickly really right yet mm. but we know the stall happened p- because of that massive climb yeah so yeah the oh. people in the aircraft probably knew something was going on by now mm. if you climb that quickly you would be able to feel the g-force yeah like similar to taking off do you wear seat belts when during the flight you've been on a flight and i can't remember yes okay you have a little lap lap belt can you take them off can you take it when off? they say you can and then sometimes you get a little like dun dun when they tell you to put them back on again normally during turbulence so my cousin was actually an air hostess and she had, she's been through some very very bad turbulence wow. where the whole uh, food trolley actually hit the ceiling of the plane oh my goodness yeah. oh yeah because i've seen movies where the air hostesses yeah strap themselves strap in. themselves so in. yeah the, everything was rattling so much you could literally... get seriously injured if you oh, weren't yeah. strapped down and properly. that's why they tell you to wear the seat belt yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, wow, like things the are just, whole food trolley. Things were just flying. Yeah, literally, it just. I mean, it wasn't going down the aisle at that point. Yeah, but like it was sandwiches in the back. everywhere. Yeah, well, it wasn't a sandwich. Hot food, coffee, <gasps> burns. Oh my goodness! Yeah. yeah, I think there are quite a few videos actually of like turbulence that hits when people have had the little trolley going down, or people have been walking in the aisle and they just end up in the sky. Covered in egg mayo. Yeah, landing on the lap of a random fellow flyer. <laughs> so, all commercial airlines are put through stall tests. So mm. the planes themselves. I put through stall tests. Um, But they don't know why this specific plane got to this dangerous point because a lot of the planes have equipment in them that should tell them you're about to stall. Tells the pilots. Planes are now built to be very, you know, two-way, very, like, information sharing. Like, it's something for the pilot to input information and also to receive information back from the computers. Yeah. Um, Pilots are trained in how to recognize stalls. In fact, the first thing pilots are trained to do is the approaching stall. And when cadets go off to RF leaming, in our case, one of the things the pilots that take them up offer them are stalls. Right. Okay. So the, it's a common thing to do. You know, probably a lot of the cadets of our squadron have lived through a stall in a plane. Right. Okay. Because it's just a, a little air It's sorter. one of the yeah. things you it's have just, to It's just know. something to do. It's just an air sortie. They're just like, yeah. It's an easy maneuver. Yeah. And it explains very really how the principles of flight work yeah yeah so the captain of the air asia flight we know was a former fighter pilot so he's used to a bit of extreme yeah yeah so and fighter jets are known for take so when we talk about uh the turning and the angles of planes we talk about the angle of attack quite a lot and that's this angle of the wing the angle of attack in fighter plets, fighter plets, <laughs> fighter jets is incredible. They take banking, like you've seen fighter jets fly, haven't you? Yeah. They shoot round, they take corners at incredible, like banked angles. So he should definitely have known how to get out of a stall. Mm-hmm. You know, he had 20,000 hours under his belt for flying. Like he, he should have known how to uh, recover the, the plane. And even if the plane stalled it, self it doesn't explain like you know how they weren't yeah, able to get out of think that. like what happened what must have happened yeah so there must have been other factors at yeah. play so a lot of different people have been trying to simulate this crash because one of the ways we can find out about how crashes happened is to simulate the crash 
or it's good for learning it's good for you know stopping it happening again if you can train replicating the conditions it's the it's good for manufacturers of planes yeah they can take the data and see what went wrong how can we fix it it's good for training pilots because they can think about how they would have sorted it out but also if we have all the information about you know what the altitude was what speed we were going at we can almost play out the scenarios so we can get a better insight into what just happened mm. like even if we don't find out you know if we can't make people better pilots because of it we can still get closure for the families of the people exactly. where the crash had happened yeah so we can read every indicator the exact same way that the air asia pilots did so we can input them all into it the instruments are explained in the exact same way the simulator will be the exact same as the a320 that they were flying in right so the instruments in the aircraft they give you information don't they yes yeah and sometimes they can be wrong so it's how do pilots figure out how to interpret information even if it's wrong Okay. So in my job, I have to use ECG monitors and SATS monitors a lot. And sometimes they can flash up false readings. Okay. So sometimes your ECG trace will go flat. And say your patient doesn't have a heart rate. But you can tell quite quickly that they do have a heart rate. Yeah. So how can a pilot understand the difference between a reading that is broken and a reading that is correct? Well, would they look at other, yeah. other sources of the so information they, and compare? Yeah. So they... They can look at other factors. Mm-hmm. So if you do get instrument failure, you have to be able to recognize that it is a failure and then know what to do and not follow that faulty instrument. Yeah. Because then you can cause the aircraft to go into over control and at that point anything can happen. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you have if the aircraft's telling you you're banked right, but you know you're straight and you think, Oh, I'll just bank right to correct it, then suddenly you're upside down. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was part, that was a big part of this investigation was Mm -hmm. to see what happened with these instruments. Can we simulate it? Can we go forward? Another big part of this investigation was about the weather because we've said it's either going to be instrumental, pilot, or weather. Human. Yeah, human pilot. Yes, yeah. Providing your pilot is human. (laughs) (laughs) And it's not, what was the name? Layla. Leica. Leica. Leica the dog. Rest in power. Leica. Yeah, rest in power. Uh, so we're trying to investigate now what happened to the plane okay so did the plane break up in its descent so the indonesian investigators were reviewing the data relating to the distribution of debris across the java sea and they think it's pretty certain that the aircraft went down in one piece right okay the wreckage pattern didn't indicate any breakups prior to hitting the water so they just have to look at the wreckage itself and the telltale sign that the aircraft went into the water tail first was how the debris was laid out in the sea. So the tail likelihood first. is it went in tail first. So like backwards? Uh, yeah. So whether it whether it actually went in, obviously at a straight angle, probably not, but mm. it probably went in at a banked angle, tail first, but that would make sense in a stall where we've already figured out that the pilots were climbing. Yeah. Instead of nose diving, yeah, yeah. we went down kind of tail, okay, tail okay. first. So after studying the wreckage of the Airbus A320, as well as, you know, the black boxes, the cockpit recorder, the Indonesian National Transport Safety Committee issued a report with the conclusions of the investigation on December 1st, 2015. So it was like a year of like information collecting. Yes, yeah. So the report stated that the sequence of events that led to the crash started with the malfunction in two of the plane's rudder travel limiter units. So they're called RTLUs. Right, okay. So rudder travel limiter units. So a tiny soldered electrical connection in the plane's RTLU was found to be cracked. <sighs> likely for over a year. And just that tiny thing. Well, some other things, but that also made That's- a big thing. So that, what what that tiny little crack in that soldered RTLU did was intermittently, it sent an AMDA, AMDA? It sent an AMBER master caution warning to the electronic centralized aircraft monitor, which is also known as the ECAM. 
So right. basically the the main electrical hub monitor. Like the dashboard. So it was basically sending out a little error message. This little crack in the soldering was sending out a little error message with the plane's maintenance record showing that this RTLU warning had been sent 23 times the previous year. Right. So for a and year it was previous, never checked. No. It was it was always solved but never further investigated, which could have addressed the underlying electrical problem. So they solved it. They thought, oh, it's not doing it anymore. Oh, it was solved because the error message stopped. Yeah, they were like, oh, it stopped. But they never investigated. They never really investigated why it was doing it. If they'd gone in and investigated why they were doing it, um, by resetting the RTLU system, they would have found that out. So, like we've already said, on this flight, the RTLU system sent an amber caution warning four different times so specifically it's done it 23 times over the previous year but four different times on this specific flight oh my goodness yeah so the first three times that the ecam gave the warning so it said auto flight rudder travel limiter system that's the warning it gave up so that's telling them there's something wrong with their rtlu but yeah. something specifically with the auto flight part of it so the pilot in command followed the ECAM instructions, toggled the flight augmentation computer. Uh, this procedure cleared the Amber Master caution warnings. So he did what he was meant to do for the first three times that he did that. Yeah. So specifics in the report then indicated that the French first officer, Remy Emmanuel Palessi, was at the controls just before the stall warning sounded in the cockpit, indicated that the jet had lost lift. The less experienced pilot. Yeah. So the investigators also found that just moments earlier, on the fourth occurrence of the RTLU warning, the captain chose to ignore procedures advised by the ECAM instructions and instead left his seat and reset the circuit breaker for the entire FAC. So for the entire control unit. Disengaging multiple flight control systems which would have been turned on by the pilot after the circuit breakers are reset. So basically, by him switching off at the main panel, he switched off a bunch of different programs that then he would need to go in and manually open back up again. Why? So this circuit breaker is not on the list of circuit breakers that are allowed to be reset in flight. Yeah. And both, but by doing this, basically, they disabled all of the safety features in place um, and placed the aircraft into what's called alternate law mode which disengages auto plier and stops the automatic stall protection bank ankle protection so by him wow. switching off the Sh by... well surely he must have known no he didn't so he, he didn't know that that would reset everything else well maybe he well you're not meant to do it during flight so he, surely must, have... he must have known that maybe maybe he must have known oh my goodness yeah so he switched off basically the two bits of information that were going to tell him he was stalling mm. and the bank angle protection. So the bank angle protection is like a correction measure to correct out the plane if they get into the position where they're going to stall. Yeah. So one tells you you're stalling, the other one kind of helps mm -hmm. you to stop stalling. So the FAC is the part of the fly-by-wire system which is responsible for controlling the flight services, including the rudder. So he's just switched off the rudder. <laughs> So right. without the FAC's computerized flight augmentation, pilots would have to rely on manual flying skills, which are often stretched during sudden airborne emergency. Yeah. So if you can only imagine, like, in the majority of flight in current day, pilots take off on their own, they use all autopilot for the majority of the time, and then they land. Yeah. If you haven't had to fly a plane manually... Other than take off and landing. It's kind of like you forget. <laughs> it yeah. could be that those skills become a little tiny bit weaker. Yeah. And now you have to do this in the in an emergency setting. So you're stressed. Your anxiety's up. Adrenaline is up. And now you're having to do something that you haven't done in a long time and that you're not skilled at. Mm. Recipe for disaster. Oh, yeah. So when the crew was required to fly the Airbus A320 manually, there was an unexplained nine second delay between the start of the roll and either pilot attempting to take control. So the plane just started rolling for nine seconds and they were probably just flapping about. Probably panicking. Panicked. And then nine seconds later, they, they think, oh God, mm. we're facing the wrong way. 
So nine seconds after, the aircraft was banking at a 54 degree angle. So if you imagine a right angle is 90 degrees. Yeah. Imagine halfway between a right angle and like a tiny bit more. Yeah. That's the angle they were at after nine seconds. After being horizontal. Oh. Yeah. So the report- All my contribution is at the moment to this yeah. podcast is wows wow. and oohs and railies because I'm just, this is fascinating stuff. Yeah. So the report didn't specifically conclude that the pilot error caused the crash. Mm. Um, but while detailing the chain of events, they did mention the fact that the pilot probably shouldn't have turned off all of that. Equipment. I mean, I mean, it's kind of a glaring. <laughs> yeah. You so, know. however, one of the investigators, the NTSC, which is the investigatory body, mm. They referred to a apparent miscommunication between the pilots based on the recordings of the cockpit voice recorder. Right. So they said that the malfunction should not have led to a total loss of control and that if they had followed the recommended procedure. So they've listened to them talking and they've said that they weren't basically following procedure. So one example of this miscommunication between the pilots was when the plane was in a critical stalling condition the co-pilot misunderstood the captain's command. So the captain's command was pull down. So instead of pushing the aeroplane's nose down, pushing forward on the stick to mm. regain speed and ag- escape the stall, he pulled back on the stick, which would have ordered the plane to climb. Yeah. So when he said pull down, he pulled down towards him instead of pulling down away from him. That is quite a vague instruction, though. Is that is that sort yeah, of no, it is a vague pilot in- nomenclature? No, it's a vague instruction, which ordered the plane to climb more steeply because the captain was also pushing the stick forward. So you'll know in aircrafts, you have a obviously a pilot, a co-pilot, but mm. almost like in cars that you learn to drive with, there's dual controls. Yeah. So they sit next to each other. So because the captain was pushing forward on the stick and the co-pilot was in his mind pushing down on the sticks or pulling it backwards the airbus system you know has these two inputs they cancelled each other out right okay, which yeah meant they might as well have not just been touching they might have not, not been touching them at all touching yeah. them at all because the plane remains can they not stalled. see each other when they're at the sti- probably you're not looking at another it's just it's yeah. you're not looking at another pilot's i suppose when you're at that angle and you're falling so quickly and you're at that angle you probably get tunnel vision because you're you've so got, well, panicked. With the, with the G-force as well, it's probably quite hard to turn your yeah. head to look at the other person. I mean, I guess I could stick. deliberate all day. I guess we'll never really yeah. know, but all so, we know are the facts. Yeah, so they remained in the stall condition until the end of the black box recording. Oh my goodness me. Yeah. So, just to like wrap it up, we yeah. can just have a little talk about the uh, the victims. Yeah, of course. So, Air Asia released the details of the... 155 passengers which included 137 adults and 17 children and one infant so the crew consisted of two pilots four flight attendants and a company engineer who was also on board but he wasn't counted as a passenger because he they just counted him as a crew right he was okay a company engineer so 41 of the people on board the air asia flight were members of a single church really yeah Oh, so forty one. Were they like going on a? I don't know. Must have been a group trip or something. Yeah, Yeah. but forty one members. So almost like a third of the of of the plane's passenger numbers. Probably whole families. Yeah, yeah. So most were families with young children, and oh, here we go. They were traveling to Singapore for a New Year's holiday. Right. Okay. So that's what they were. Oh, that is awful. Yeah, so the bodies began to be returned to their families on the 1st of January. Uh, at that time, the East Java Regional Police Department's Disaster Victim Identification and Commissioner, again, mouthful of a job, mm. um, stated that the victims were identified um, in the post-mortem results by thumbprints and their personal belongings. Yeah, I can't even imagine that job. Yeah, so pretty... Horrific stuff. Very horrific. We yeah. we would say all their names if we had time to. Yeah. Um, just to commemorate them, but obviously, you know what? What else can you say? Yeah. And just nine months after the Air Asia. Yeah. The Malaysia. Flight, Malaysian even, Airlines. Yeah. Malaysian Airlines that went missing. This one goes missing. Well, not missing, but this one crashes. So sad. And we never will never really know why they 
climb that quickly. No, exactly. And I think I think before I sounded quite critical of the pilot, but ultimately I will never know what the situation yeah. was exactly. So, I mean, you know, I can't yeah. really criticize At the end them. of the day, probably something that's gone against protocol to switch stuff off. Yeah. But... We've also, still got to remember that. Yeah, I mean, also, if you're doing this on a daily basis, like, uh, especially at my work, we silence alarms all the time, like, mm. constantly. The yeah. alarms go off 20... And it's also very times. easy to grow complacent, I guess. Yeah. That so he probably, just thought, he probably just... just thought this alarm has been going. Especially if he's done, what, 6,000 hours worth of flight. He's probably been on a fair few of those flights where it's kept beeping. And yeah. he's just silenced it and everything's been okay. It's one of those, everyone probably, does it. Probably just thought, you know what, I'll switch this off and it'll be all right. I mean, there are, so there are really quite a few factors. You've got the instrument issue where yeah. we've, well, we've got a lack of instrument. We've got the pilot issues so with the miscommunication. And then, Really, we've got the weather because if they didn't have to divert in the first place, would this ever have happened? If they were allowed to take the course they were requesting, would this ever have happened? Well, it is like, you know, pardon the pun, but it is the perfect storm. Yeah. It's like every every single one of those factors were included in this disaster. Yeah, and this is very similar to the next one we're going to talk about, which is the Air France um, crash. Yeah. It's got, you know, the F. France crash was again something to do with communication. It was something to do with a bit of an equipment malfunction. Not so much to do with the weather, but still, it's, it follows kind of the same, uh, yeah. the same loop. And I think that one was uh, definitely more changing of the aeronautical scape, yeah, and things like that. But that is the air crash investigation for this week. Indonesian Air Flight eight five zero one. Yeah. So all the victims, obviously, rest in peace um thank you so much for that sergeant white that was fascinating and i am really looking forward to hearing about malaysian airlines next week yeah malaysian airlines air france and yeah we'll talk about a few others as well brilliant stuff well thank you for listening everybody thank you very much and we will be back next week uh make sure you follow us on spotify we release a podcast every single week and we will premiere our stream on youtube so make sure you tune into that as well and thank you for listening bye Tara. Thank you for listening to Go Any Last Words, a weekly podcast for air cadets, released every Friday. Go Any Last Words was written, produced, and presented by Sergeant White and CI Me of 361 Gates of Squadron. Sound effects by Motion Array. Podcast theme is Grow by KV.